Stories are well known for having three basic parts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Today we're going to look at the last part of that and see how it's been expanded into sequels, series, and sometimes even entire universes. We're going to look at how eager big corporations are to make those sequels even when it comes at the expense of original storytelling. Are you ready? Part 1. Ordinary Magic. Ordinary Magic is a 2012 book written by Caitlin Rubino Bradway and published by Bloomsbury. It tells the story of one ordinary, someone without the capability of magic in a world in which magical powers are the default. Being an Ord marks our main character, Abby, as a minority in danger, akin to the impression several different minority groups face in the real world. Because of this, Ords with kind and supportive families, such as Abby, are often sent to boarding school where they are trained on practical survival tools and learn ways to combat the magic and monsters they face every day. As the school year progresses, Abby gains more skills, but as she does this, monsters begin attempting to penetrate the school. As friends disappear, Abby and her friends must unite and use the skills they've learned to protect each other. The climax is a triple, near-quadruple kidnapping and a momentary victory in a small battle. And then it ends. That's it. It is a genre-bending, innovative, and complete story. There is a beginning, middle, and end. There is no sequel here and no further world. That's the end. Part 2. What is a sequel? The word sequel originally meant a train of followers, but over time it has come to mean a story set in the same world as a previous one and continuing the adventure the second book in the series. It comes from the Proto-Indo-European root skew, meaning to follow. Often sequels disappoint fans and sometimes even their creators, but what makes a good sequel? Recognizable characters? Consistent themes? Satisfying beginnings, middles, and ends? All those put together? Maybe it's a bunch of different things. Maybe it's some unspeakable X factor However, for our purposes, I have distilled it into three criteria. One, it must contain the elements of a good story on its own merits. That is to say, a beginning, middle, and compelling characters, emotional stakes, all that shit. A sequel cannot succeed on, oh, look, it's like that other thing. It must be a complete story by itself. Look at any book series. Does the first Hunger Games end partway through the game so that the second one can start right in the middle with no setup? Does New Moon start with Edward on his way to the Volturi and Bella all sad and expect you to fill in who everyone is and what the relationships are all by yourself? No. Every new installment takes a moment to establish who the key players are and what they are doing in this story. To contrast this, let's look at the Disney sequels. They pay lip service to this idea, but beyond the bare minimum of what is necessary to the plot, if you don't know the characters or world building, that's up to you to figure out. Mulan 2 doesn't explain who her friends are. It doesn't really explain who Mushu is. These are wildly imperfect sequels, and there is a big reason why. 2. The sequel must follow a logical thread from the previous story. Just because the first story ended doesn't mean every plot thread has concluded. The first Hunger Games novel is a complete story, but there is still the lingering thread of precedent snow. In The Hobbit, Bilbo returns home and the adventure is over, and yet... What about that ring? In Twilight, Bella is safe and everyone is happy, but Jacob delivers a cryptic warning. You need a conflict from your initial story to deal with if you want to continue the story. Look at the sad, slow death of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. The first story, perfect, contained. By the end, almost everything is wrapped up, right? The first trilogy even is decent at this, but... Beyond that, they clearly lose focus, and the problems become more manufactured and less and less believable. They're not connected to the actual characters that we care about. Finally, and most crucially, a sequel must justify its own existence. In the real world, this means it must make money, but artistically, this means that the story you are telling should have a point. Suzanne Collins wanted to expand on her world building and further critique dictatorships and the methods they use to control their population. Tolkien desperately needed 
to channel his decades of trauma and meticulous world building and notes into a fantasy epic to rival Beowulf. Stephanie Meyer wanted to, uh, make the sexy monster boys sad. To again look at the Pirates franchise as a contrast, what is Dead Men Tell No Tales for? What is it doing? Not, not a, not a lot. It doesn't expand the world. I didn't finish that sentence in the script. What is Dead Men Tell No Tales saying? Part three, Lord of the Rings, Tolkien. So, Jolkin, Rollin, Rollkin, Tolkien. A professor of Old and Middle English at several universities, most notably Oxford, he was a lieutenant in the First World War and one of the first people to ever translate Beowulf from Old English. He was also just concerningly smart. From a fairly early age, Tolkien showed proficiency with linguistics and eventually invented a whole mythology complete with several distinct original languages and fully formed political structures along with their respective histories. His first published work in this world was The Hobbit. Published in 1937, it was met with general acclaim and popularity to the point that his publisher asked for a sequel. He jumped at this chance to, uh, ooh, yeah, invent high fantasy. After a new, slightly edited version of The Hobbit was released, the first volume of The Lord of the Rings came out in 1954. I would argue that this is perhaps the greatest sequel of all time, and certainly one of the most influential. I am perhaps biased both by the sheer cultural eclipse that Lord of the Rings has had over The Hobbit, and the fact that I just, I, I like Lord of the Rings significantly more. That aside, The Lord of the Rings captures everything I think a sequel should be. It takes the elements that are there in the original story, Middle-earth, hobbits, dragons, elves, other things probably, and expands on those greatly. Whole new countries and political systems, more hobbit culture, and also just like a lot of weed. Tolkien, why is there so much weed? Other more terrifying monsters and a whole mythology. The stakes are appropriately raised with connections and a line to the Hobbit. Bilbo, Gandalf, and the Ring provide a through line where any readers who may have read The Hobbit first can instantly be emotionally connected. Despite all of this, it works brilliantly as a self-contained story while still rewarding those who have done the homework, so to speak. The Hobbit movies... Um... Um... You can apply a lot of the principles of what makes a sequel work to prequels. And those movies fail at all of them. They are not good individual works, as The Hobbit is a fairly short book stretched across over nine hours of film. And it feels like the movies were created backwards to inspire the nostalgic feelings in their audience rather than to be a good story in and of themselves. Despite these travesties, Tolkien revolutionized the world of storytelling and genre, and created perhaps one of the first modern examples of a connected world. And then he died. Part four. Endings. Death is an ending. You get it. Jokes, segues, etc. Barbosa, Palpatine, and Spock all had perfect endings that were stolen from them by sequels. Anyway, uh, humans hate endings. Most things we as a society associate with sadness have something to do with endings. Death, breakups, court sentences, the impending heat death of the universe. You are more likely to remember a vacation that started with rain and ended in blazing sunlight rather than the other way around. We dread and fear endings, and yet they have an inflated significance in our minds. Endings are good, endings are necessary, and yet endings are something to be feared and avoided. Who hasn't clung to a relationship longer than they should? We have a tendency to stagnate, and this bleeds into our media. Look at what Marvel has been doing for the last, like, ten years. Look at what Amazon is doing to Tolkien's universe with a show, and presumably even more content coming in the future. Look at all of Disney Plus's output from the last ten years. At 2021's Disney Plus Day, out of the dozens of projects that were announced, 
I counted only two that weren't either a sequel or a reboot. As true complete endings have become rarer, we as audience members have become used to larger, more spectacular endings. Without this, we become disappointed and so things continue on and on and they live a little sad half-life where originality has long ceased to be even part of the conversation. Nothing is allowed to rest if it can make a profit. Part 5. Capitalism. Capitalism kills art. Why do we need another Home Alone movie, another Star Wars installment, another Disney property? What is so bad about truly original concepts? In this modern era, risks are dismissed out of hand, and innovation is forsaken for the sake of the familiar. The offer is dead, and Bob Iger killed them. What do I mean by that? The best art comes from risk, from mistakes, from insanity. Look at things like Squid Game, Jojo Rabbit, innovative and endlessly creative pieces of art that are wildly successful even today, and yet studios are unwilling to take the chance. Look at Van Gogh, Da Vinci, Monet. They all took risks to create art, and centuries later, they're the ones who stick with us. No one remembers the guy who painted Queen Victoria or Henry VIII because they didn't do anything new. They played it safe, and that's okay, that's still art, but that doesn't advance the form. George Lucas is revolutionary for taking a chance on big-budget sci-fi, Spielberg for practically inventing the blockbuster. The media industry of today would never allow these things to happen, they're too risky. Movies have become too big to be allowed to fail. When the mid-budget movie was killed, innovation died along with it. New stories have been abandoned in favor of safe sequels, prequels, reboots, and seaboots. Disney, in its quest to become the sole purveyor of your entertainment, has killed the very thing that brought it to prominence in the first place. Pixar, once purely an artistic, insanely innovative studio, is making sequels and reboots now. The loss of original story means a loss of culture. Stories are the oldest type of culture. They are how we have spread culture for the years and across continents. Without stories, we lose the essence of what makes us human. There are still creative, wonderful storytellers, but they're becoming fewer and further between. Part 6. Complete Stories Remember that silly little book I mentioned at the beginning? Ordinary Magic? If you don't remember, then just scroll back to the beginning and watch it again. Okay? You have nothing to lose but time. Ordinary Magic is a book that I love. And it is one of the most frustrating books I have ever read. The world building and conceptual nature of the universe presented are fascinating and well executed. The story is impeccable and well presented. There is a logical and intriguing sequel hook, and yet... The book ends. There is no sequel. Rubino Bradway has said in an interview with Fangirl Nation that she would love to make as many sequels as possible, however, at time of recording, this has not happened. As it stands, this is a singular, complete story. And that is special. The lack of a sequel makes this a complete piece, no risk of it being stretched out until it fell into a painful half-life of irrelevance. See Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. And that is beautiful. There is a value in seeing something that is complete, one story, beginning to end. Art strives to imitate life, but it is impossible to capture the full extent of a life in one piece of art. It would stand, therefore, that the most effective way to achieve the goal of art, if such a thing can be said to exist at all, would be to not even try you see, art has this thing called plot, and life doesn't exactly follow any sort of plot. If you try to imitate a complete life, it often makes a bad story. The most successful pieces of art take a piece of a life, a few days, one event, one portion of someone's life. If you try to encapsulate someone's entire existence, it gets messy and unrealistic. Fast. Sequels are the first step to a meandering story with no clear end or point. A complete story like Ordinary Magic is a dying and beautiful breed. Capitalist tendencies and the increasing monopolization of the entertainment industry are leading to reduced innovation, and the human nature that drives us to avoid endings at all costs isn't helping. 
As frustrating as a single complete story can be, it's a valuable creation and we should encourage its production.